Good evening and uh, welcome back if you were with us this morning and a uh, warm welcome to any who are joining us for the first time this Sunday. Can I say to, to those who are watching the video maybe after Sunday, maybe through the week, uh, we trust that as you watch this video, whatever the reason was you came upon the video or, or, or for whatever the circumstances are that you find you watching it now, uh, we trust that as you watch the video, that you will know God's blessing on your life as you um, worship with us and as you listen to God's word as it's ministered to us uh, through the video. Well, we had one brother this morning and now we have the other brother this evening. Lewis Stevenson is a member of Bethany Baptist Church in Bangor. And um, as I said this morning, Lewis is a student at the Irish Baptist College Lewis has just completed his second year of studies uh, at the college and we wish Lewis uh, all God's blessing on his continued studies as he looks to going into third year um, come the autumn uh, and again we want to thank Lewis as we thanked Alex this morning for his willingness to help us this evening. Another thing about this evening that's going to be different is that we are no longer going to continue our um, tea and biscuits times after our evening service. Well, in this lockdown, we're all uh, sitting around too much and uh, having too much to eat maybe and, and all putting on far too much weight. So we decided that uh, we, we wouldn't do our, our, um, our tea and biscuits times after our evening services um, anymore. Uh, maybe there's something you're not aware of, um, a facility that has been added to our uh, face group, um, private group page. Uh, and that's a facility called Chat Rooms. Uh, go on to the Facebook group page, that's our private uh, Facebook group. Uh, if you're not on that, then, then ask to be added to that. And if you're a member of the church, uh, we get that organised for you. But go on to the, that group uh, and, and check out the, the Chat Rooms. It's a facility that allows up to eight people to, um, to do video chatting um, through that. So that's an opportunity for you to get together maybe after a Sunday evening service be a group of up to eight get together and, and you can have your tea and biscuits that way but we'll not be continuing those uh, at the end of our evening services any further now in a moment or two uh, i'm going to hand over to lewis and uh, lewis is going to read to us from 2 corinthians chapter 4 and then after lewis reads um paula and lucy uh, will come and they will um, lead us in praise as we sing together how deep the father's love and then after that, Lewis will come and minister to us from God's word. But before we do all that, uh, let's come together in prayer. Let's just commit our time uh, together this evening to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you, uh, as we come into your presence, we come with rejoicing. Uh, rejoicing in your love for us and in your faithfulness to us. We give thanks to you for the assurance we have in Jesus Christ that in him we have full salvation. In him we have total forgiveness. In him we have a rich inheritance through you. Father, we thank you that you still speak to us through your word, our Bibles. We rejoice in the timeless authority we find in them and for the wonder of you that we find in the pages of your word. Father, we bless you that through our Bibles, through your revelation to us in the written word, you have given us all that we need to live for you. Lord, this evening as Lewis opens up your word and as we ponder it together for a while, Lord, we pray that you will speak into our lives through your Holy Spirit in a way that meets us where we are today and in a way that will equip us for tomorrow. Lord, Meet with us this evening, we pray, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, Port of the Down. I hope that you're keeping well in lockdown. It's unfortunate that we cannot meet together as God's gathered church this evening, but we wait for that day and we long for that day 
when we'll be able to meet corporately again to worship and to praise our King. This evening we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, so I invite you to open your Bibles there. We'll be thinking about 2 Corinthians 4, 1-6, and we'll just take time now to read God's Word. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1 says this, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we will commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is failed, it is failed to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we proclaim, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. And we'll end our reading there. i <laughs> 
Paul begins our passage this evening in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, in verse 1, by saying these words, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Paul tells us that his ministry of preaching the gospel, his ministry of being a herald for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his ministry of being a minister of the new covenant, is by God's abundant mercy. God transformed Paul's life from being a preacher of Judaism to become a preacher of the gospel, from being a persecutor of the church to become the persecuted. And here he tells us that it is God's mercy that brought about this transformation and that called him to this gospel work. Yet although this was a glorious privilege, it was a gruelling and demanding task. Constantly Paul was bombarded with slanderous lies about him from false teachers. Frequently on his missionary journeys he was met with hostility and physical persecution. In fact in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians in verse 8 if you flick down there Paul writes this. Verse 8 of chapter 4. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. He experienced extreme affliction and persecution during this work. And yet despite this persecution... Despite the gruelling nature of gospel work, Paul is able to say in verse 1, Having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. He is not a deserter. He does not surrender. He is not a card. Instead, he keeps pressing forward. He keeps moving on with gospel work. In 1 Peter 2, 9, we read these familiar words. You'll, you'll, You'll know these words. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 9, But you, speaking to Christian, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. If you are a Christian, Peter says, You have become a Christian, and with your new identity, You must proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. Yes, there are men who are gifted for full-time gospel service. We've got the preachers and the pastors. We've got the evangelists. Then we've got the church planters and the missionaries. All who are engaged and gifted for full-time gospel work. Yet Peter in 1 Peter 2.9 tells us that every Christian has a responsibility, wherever they are, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called them. Therefore, in your unique workplace, surrounded by those unique people, you are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. In your unique friend group, you are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. When we go back to university and back to schools after the COVID is over, your purpose there is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. However, when we proclaim the excellencies of him who called us, we're going to be met with hostility and rejection. And many of you will know this. In fact, last year, I was, uh, last summer, I was in a neighbourhood with uh, a church and we were engaging in door-to-door outreach and we knocked on one man's door and he opened the door, he looked at our Bible and then immediately slammed the door in our faces. He rejected us. He rejected the gospel. And discouragement came Likewise, maybe this evening you're feeling discouraged because you're continually sharing the gospel with a particular family member and they keep rejecting us, rejecting Christ. Well, this is why it's vital 
that every Christian listens to the teaching of 2 Corinthians 4, 1-6. Because here Paul informs us that there are three essential truths that we must grasp before we can say with him, we do not lose heart. There are three essential truths that we must grasp if we are to keep pressing on and we are, are to keep moving forward with gospel work instead of allowing rejection to paralyze us with discouragement. We must grasp these three essential truths if we are to press on proclaiming the excellencies of the one who has called us from darkness into his marvelous light. So this first truth, truth number one, that we must grasp is this. Unbelievers are blind to the gospel of the glory of Christ. Look at verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 says this. And even if our gospel is failed, it is failed to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The glory of Christ refers to his intrinsic beauty and his infinite value. The glory of Christ refers to all that he is and all that he has done that makes him lovely and altogether desirable. And God and Christ, the Son of God, who is the image of God, reveals to us what God is like. Therefore, if Christ is infinitely beautiful and altogether desirable, then likewise the Father, God the Father, is infinitely beautiful and God the Spirit is infinitely beautiful. The triune God is infinitely beautiful and altogether desirable. Think for a moment about the most, des uh, the most beautiful thing you possess or you know maybe husbands that you're wives because they are so beautiful to you maybe wives that your husband maybe uh, parents that your kids and your uh, your or grandparents that your grandchildren or maybe it's materials your fancy car or that diamond ring whatever it is think about that thing which is most beautiful in your eye and yet when we compare these things to Christ, they are nothing. They are nothing. This is why Paul wrote in uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus my Lord. Everything compared to Jesus is nothing. If we say we have scales, we have scales. On, on, on this side... We have all the treasure of this world, all the beautiful things of this world, and it goes down. And then we put Christ and, uh, and the Father and the Spirit, and then it explodes into the ground. Why? Because Christ, the Father, and the Spirit are infinitely beautiful. They are much more valuable than anything in this world. Yet... Unbelievers are blind to this reality. They're blind to the gospel of the glory of Christ. There is a feel over their minds and over their hearts. They are unable to see the beauty of Christ and the glory of the gospel. So when they hear Christians proclaim the excellencies of him who called them, unbelievers look at them and think that they are weird when they see Christians uh, gathering together on Sundays, pre-COVID that is, when they see Christians gathering together on Sundays, they they look at them and they just they just they're confused. They they see Christ as boring. They see God as uh, as as unattractive, and yet they're like, how can these Christians find so much joy and beauty in Christ? Did you notice? The reason Paul gives for this blindness. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Satan is active in our world convincing and persuading unbelievers that God is not beautiful. That he is not pleasurable. Uh, there's no pleasure 
with him. And this is the tragedy, isn't it? The unbeliever sees more beauty and finds the, the newest iPhone more desirable than the eternal Son of God. To them, God is boring, not beautiful. He is dull, not desirable. Why? Because they are blind to the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And this is the first essential truth that we must grasp. Unbelievers are blind to the, to the gospel of the glory of Christ. But how does grasping this truth help us to keep pressing forward with gospel work? How does this truth ensure that we do not lose heart as we proclaim the excellencies of Christ? Well, this truth helps us press on because it reminds us to expect rejection. So when you knock on that door and door to door outreach, when that resumes, and we can't do that now because of COVID, but when that resumes, when you knock on that door, you should expect rejection. Or when you speak to that family member, do not be surprised if they reject you. Why? Because they are blind. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. When we grasp this first truth, we will not lose heart. Instead, we will, con we will continue to press on to proclaim the excellencies of Christ, because we will expect rejection. We will not be surprised by rejection. This is the first essential truth. But the second essential truth that I want us to think about from this passage is this. God alone enables the blind to see. God alone enables the blind to see. In Ephesians 2, it's a very familiar passage, Ephesians 2, Paul describes the condition of the unbeliever, of those who are outside of Christ. And he says that they are dead in their trespasses and sins. They are spiritually dead. And yet, in this passage, he describes the deadness of the unbeliever. And then he says these words, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. But God... What an amazing and glorious phrase. Because God is God, there is hope. Because God is God, there is hope for the dead. The offer of life can provide the spiritually dead with life. Likewise, here in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul shows us the same truth. Because God is God, there is hope for the spiritually blind. The creator of light can give the spiritually blind vision. And with this said, look at verse 6 of chapter 4. Verse 6 says this, For God who said, Let sh light shine out of the darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here Paul deliberately uh, compares the Genesis 1 narrative with our conversion. Our conversion is an act of creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The universe, uh, in the beginning, the universe could only be brought into existence by a uh, eternal by the eternal all-powerful God likewise the ability to see the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ could only be brought about by an act of the eternal almighty all-powerful God this reminds us that we cannot do it ourselves we we are unable to open our own eyes or, or, or to Open, the, uh, open our friend's eyes to see the glory of God. Instead, we need God to work. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And Christian, this is what happens in your life the moment of your conversion. 
A divine miracle took place. An explosive balm of grace detonated in your life. It hit your life and transformed you. Your conversion may not seem as impressive as others externally. So you think that the, the person who is saved from an alcoholic addiction and comes to Christ and their life is transformed, you think that that conversion is more impressive than the person who was uh, saved at his children's meeting when they were younger. Or when you look at Paul's conversion, this, this man who was a violent persecutor of the Church of Christ was on the road to Damascus and then he was struck by Christ and Christ transformed him and it brought him to be a minister of the gospel. When you look at Paul's conversion, you can think that this is more impressive than my own. And yet the truth of scripture is this, that every conversion to Christ is the same internally. They look different externally, the situation differs, but the internal work is the same. An explosive bomb of grace has detonated in your life. God has took his all-powerful and life-transforming work and placed it into your life to make light shine in to the darkness. And what a wonder this is this evening. If you are a Christian who has been brought to Christ to, to see his glory, to see his work on the cross as lovely, to see his resurrection as amazing, then give thanks because you've only been able to see this because God has worked a divine miracle in your life. The only reason we look at the cross and see the greatest demonstration of love, not foolishness, is because God has worked in your life. Give thanks today for your conversion. Give thanks to God because he has enabled you to see the beauty of Christ. Praise him because he has removed the veil from your hearts. And if you're not a Christian and you're, you have tuned into this, then thank you for tuning in. But I, I want you to, to listen to the Apostle Paul's words. He is saying you're blind to the glory of Christ. So when you look at Christ's death on the cross, you see it as unattractive. You see it as just unimpressive. When you look at his resurrection and think about his resurrection, you see it as a myth. And the reason you, you have this reaction and this response is because you're blind to the gospel of the glory of Christ. There is a feel over your minds. There's a feel over your hearts. And if you want this feel removed then you need to go to God. Only God can let light shine in the darkness. So therefore, go to God and ask him to remove that feel. Ask him to enable you to see the glory of Christ. Ask him to shine his light into your life, to transform you and enable you to see the beauty of Christ. This is the only way that this feel can be removed. By asking God. So I encourage you. If you're not a Christian. And you're listening to this. Go to God. And ask him to work. And I assure you. That if you earnestly ask him. He will not reject you. Instead he will transform your life. And show you the glory and the beauty. Of Jesus Christ. The son of God. And this is truth number two. God alone. Enables the blind to see. But once again, we need to ask, how does grasping this truth help us to press on in proclaiming Christ rather than losing heart? Well, this truth reminds us that salvation is God's work. And therefore, if we want to see people added to the kingdom, we need to depend we need to depend more, sorry, we need to, to be more dependent upon God. We need to stop relying on our own methods and our own ideas in evangelism. We need to rely more on God. Sometimes we'll say, if only I knew the answer to all the atheist questions, then they will, they will come to Christ. Or we say in our children's work, only if we know how to entertain the children and make uh, it exciting for them, then they will come to Christ. And yet this is a failure to understand the work of conversion. 
The only way someone will come to Christ is if God works in their life. And this is what Jesus says in John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You see, no one can come to Christ, no one can see the beauty of Christ unless God works in their life. We need to be more dependent upon God. Yet how do we evaluate our dependence on God? Well, I think the greatest evaluation of our dependence upon God is prayer. Do we pray for God to work? You see, prayer is a, a great and an awesome gift from our Creator. Our Heavenly Father has given His children uh, a resource to make use of to show their dependence upon Him. So if you're wanting that family member saved, and let me ask you this, are you praying earnestly for them? Are you praying that God will work in their life? If you're not, then you have failed to grasp this essential truth that God alone enables the blind to see. So when we grasp the second truth fully, we will not lose heart because we have confidence that God will work in his own way and in his own time. So this is truth number two. But truth number three, our final truth is this. God calls his people to proclaim his gospel. God calls his people to proclaim his gospel. If we grasp these previous two truths, then we could maybe be led to think, since unbelievers are blind to the gospel and God alone enables the blind to see, then do we have a responsibility? We, we can be led to think that we are actually not needed. Yet scripture reveals to us a beautiful truth. God uses his people to proclaim his gospel. And it is through this proclamation that God works miracles in the lives of unbelievers. If you're turning your Bibles to Acts 26, please. Acts 26. In Acts 26, Paul is on trial for his faith before King Agrippa. And he makes a defense for himself by recounting his testimony. And look at um, verse 15 of Acts 26. Verse 15 says this, And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you. Notice this. To open their eyes. So that, they may be, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul is being sent by Christ to open their eyes. Hold on a moment. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 tells us that God alone opens the eyes of the blind. Yet this verse seems to contradict it, but it doesn't. Paul is being commissioned to go and proclaim the gospel of Christ. And he, as he does this, God will come with his life transforming power and enable unbelievers to see. This is one of the most beautiful truths in scripture. God calls his ordinary people to engage in his extraordinary work. As we declare the gospel, God works miracles in the lives of unbelievers. We don't save. We don't open the eyes of the blind. Instead, we are faithful to God's calling and we trust that he will work. And this is the third essential truth that we must grasp. God calls his people to proclaim his gospel. And the problem, now the problem of preaching over video is that I don't have a PowerPoint behind me. Instead, I've got this, this grey wall. But if I had a PowerPoint behind me, I would highlight the words, His Gospel. So God calls His people to proclaim, highlight, His Gospel. His Gospel. Why do I highlight this? It's because our calling is not to water down the message. 
And it's not to change the message to make it more suitable for um, the secular world of the 21st century. No. Our calling is to proclaim the glorious gospel of God that has been handed down to us in scriptures. And this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 2 and 5. Verse 2 he says this, But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Our responsibility is to proclaim God's gospel. We are to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. When we talk to people, we are to say, Christ calls you to stop living life for yourself, to repent and to live life for him. This is the gospel we are to preach and any other gospel that is preached that does not match up to the gospel in scripture is not the gospel. Instead, it is a lie. And this is truth number three. God calls his people to proclaim his gospel. And once again, how does, this, how does grasping this truth help us to press on in proclaiming Christ rather than losing heart? Well, this truth enables us to see that each of us has a part to play in God's redemptive work. It encourages us to keep speaking about him wherever we are. In our families, in our workplaces, in our schools and universities, in our sports teams, in our, on our social media feed, even in our Zoom calls at the moment. We are to proclaim the excellencies of Christ. Understanding this truth will stir us up to continue proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. So this evening, as we bring uh, this message to a close, let me encourage you, even tonight after this message or during the week, to read through 2 Corinthians 4, 1-6 again. And continue to think about these three essential truths. Unbelievers are blind to the gospel of the glory of Christ. God alone enables the blind to see. And God calls his people to proclaim his gospel. When we fail to grasp these truths, we will become paralysed with discouragement when we face rejection. But when we grasp these truths, as Paul did... We will be able to say, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Instead, we will continue to press on and to preach and to proclaim the gospel of Christ. When we fully grasp these truths, we will be stirred up to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us wherever we go. Amen. Let me just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message this evening. I thank you, Lord, that you've reminded us that salvation belongs to you and we give you thanks for your work in our, our own lives. And yet, Lord, we pray for those maybe who are watching this this evening who are outside of Christ. We ask, Lord, that you will open their eyes to see the beauty of Christ. Enable them just to, to come to you, bring them and draw them to yourself. We do pray, Lord, that you will help us as Christians wherever we are wherever we go to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light help us to proclaim you to this uh, this hostile and this sinful world just be with us now and bless us in jesus name we pray amen